Kia ora everybody. I'm sitting down with the Australian version of Hunt Mountains, even though the New Zealand version of Hunt Mountains lives in Australia. Um, Toby Hines, mate, what did you do last weekend? <laughs> um, last weekend, I, fly, I was on my way back from NZ last weekend, I think. Yeah. Yep. Came, and, back, um, came back to reality. Came, came back to reality and then I went in the bush two days later and shot a deer <laughs> with the recurve, so... Not really super reality, <laughs> yeah. but um, yeah, it was good. Yeah, I, I uh, had a time of my life actually in NZ. I'd say it was one of the best hunting experiences I've I've ever had chasing deer. It's outstanding. Nice mate. Um, before um, we, before we dive into it, because people can go onto your YouTube channel and check it out and what a story it was. Um, you said you got the steer this week with the recurve. How was that to get your confidence back? <laughs> I, saw oh, you, that, I saw you said the fallow are easier. Is that right? Um, I've just uh, I've grown up with fallow hunting fallow deer and and shot enough that I don't need to shoot them. If you know what I mean, like I'll shoot them to eat and and keep the meat. And if they're really big, challenging animal, uh, I'll try them on. But I sort of got to start again when I picked up the recurve. So this one was a a low pressure. There was it wasn't a, a guided hunt. Um, in another country that I'd spent money to travel to where I'd uh, won the, I'd actually, that was a prize winner for that hunt. So I didn't have any pressure and yeah, I wasn't knowing, I was just not nervous. So <laughs> it makes all the difference. Yeah. Makes all the difference. Mate, you must be the Australian Cam Haynes because he put up that very factor the other day on, on his Instagram about how when he first started um, bow hunting, he sort of bought a $25 tag and missed 16 of them and then now he you know goes on these big hunts and all the and often has a camera crew with him and all the pressure's there that, that's what you put on yourself when you went to New Zealand did you feel a bit of that obviously yeah I, I did and I was I was excited for being in the moment as well like uh, a few of the situation where I missed I hadn't practiced or shot in that situation which I will from now on I'll practice sitting and I can't practice kneeling in mud, in long grass, on the side of a mountain in New Zealand, in the in the what's that spiky bush called? It's got two the it's um, all over the side. Spaniard I or can't. spear grass, or there's probably some proper name for it. Oh, it's that real shrub with an inch long spikes. Anyway, oh, that's everywhere. Matagari. 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 Yeah. 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 I can't. I'd have to grow a few shrubs and then just like <laughs> squash myself into them and try and shoot from them. That might help, but um, yeah, no, the, the major, the big deer I missed, I didn't get to full draw at the point of shooting because he spotted me when I was drawing, and I, and I, as I fired, I pushed the the riser, I pushed the bow away from me, which pushed the shot away from the deer across the front of his chest, and I'm pretty sure that's what happened, and that's all just down to discipline and doing it more often and not as nervous and thinking through your shot sequence, so lots of lots of things to work on. Yeah, mate. And, and what's, what's interesting about that, Manny Gary, you sort of go around and you see a big clump of it and then you look underneath and a few of those idiots have had a bed under there. What, what do you reckon? You'd feel pretty cosy under a spiky bush? Oh, you wouldn't have to worry about predators, even though they haven't, they haven't got any predators. But I found an enormous deadhead actually in there. So I don't know whether the hunter just gave up and said, no, nope, not going in to get him. But I would have. It was a huge 14 point, uh, 40 plus inch stag. And I, yeah, it was... I just saw the white tips coming out of the, the bush and then yeah, found a full deadhead. They'd, they'd actually lost this monster in, the, in a thick patch of it. Yeah, I would have been, been devoted, but I would have been crawling through it for ages and ages to, um, to find my deer. So. Yes, especially if you've hand, handed over a wad of cash. You'd, you'd hope it was someone that had handed over a wad of cash and not someone that was being a pest and, and trying to run off with somebody else's deer. Yeah, well, they'd, they'd, um, they'd actually, yeah, they'd had a few poachers the week before, actually, in the block I was in, but they never caught up with them because it's, it's NZ Mountains and they're not that actually easy to catch up with people and that stuff. So, um, yeah, I don't know what happened with that, but they, they don't seem to get a lot on that block. Nice, yeah. man. Should we start at the beginning? We, we, did, we did hunting kick off for you. Um, back, back, back of um, up, chasing roos, was that right? Yeah, I, I grew up on a farm, so it was part of everyday life to have sort of guns. And I grew up the same. I've encouraged it a little bit with my young fella, but he likes guns. He's out there now. We're boiling this deer head up, and he's 
picking up the bits of sticks that look like guns. He's got, he's got a, a toy box full of them, but he's picking up the bits of sticks that look like guns. We don't teach him that. He's just doing it. And I'll, I think I was the same when I was younger, um, not for guns, but for hunting, chasing stuff. I, my dad didn't hunt. He, he had firearms for, he kept, had a lot of uh, three or threes and old sentimental firearms from he had when he was a kid or it was his uh, grandfather's or, and so on. So, but he never hunted ever. I think we went out twice together mm-hmm. and my, my hunting was um, getting dropped off. As soon as they thought I was comfortable to shoot by myself, which was about eight or nine, I think, or nine, they dropped me off and they drive through the paddock and feed the cows and walk through the cows and take their time. And I'd walk to the other end of the paddock, which was a couple of hundred acres of our, the back of the property and I'd shoot whatever I could. So I didn't get coached into it. I had to learn the hard way. Um, here you go, off you go and kill something. I think they're pretty surprised when I did. So yeah, yeah that, that's where it all started. And then it, it just grew from there. I was just always keen, always, always asking dad to go spotlight and chase foxes. Mm-hmm. And um, I'd leave in primary school. I'd My punishment in primary school was if I didn't do my homework, they'd take the gun off me for two weeks. So take the 22, I had a 22 single shot Lithgo bolt action rifle. So it was a pretty harmless little gun to do anything with. But um, I'd walk sort of two or three Ks to the back paddock, go and try and shoot some rabbits. And I think I, uh, we, we ate some rabbit and duck. And I don't think we ate ever, ever ate any kangaroo because it's pretty wormy and we didn't really know how to cook it properly. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd no, one, no one to drive that. There was no driven force as a youngster, no exposure to any films, magazines, videos, or anything. My pop enjoyed doing it as well, but I still wasn't exposed or pushed upon me. It was just what I wanted to do. And then it grew from there. Nice. Similar, similar story here, really, without, without the privilege of being able to get out and, and, and go rabbit shooting. Luckily, a mate of mine had a, had a small deer farm that we could go and clean up the rabbit population, or at least try to. And um, close your ears, Australians, but get rid of some possums. But uh, yeah, that was that was all, all we sort of did. And, and you're right, there's no sort of hunter hunting history in our family. But uh, the, the old man and, and his father, you know, just working on some family farms, had, had done a bit of pest and varmint shooting around the place. And there's there was a 22 and a, and a shotgun locked up in a cupboard that you never never knew where it was or how to get it. <laughs> what, yeah, what's, yeah, this the secret. Yeah. What, what's the sort of, um, on, on the box of a cattle farm, you know, I drive out to a casino and, and for a long period there, um, over summer, I was kind of like, how the hell are they, these guys still got cattle on the land and then all of a sudden a spot of rain and, and, and the grass comes back. But what, what's a sort of a, a piece to, to the cattle country um, and, and how much of an uh, effect does it have? Well, kangaroos are... A pest people they're native and it's illegal to shoot them unless you you can get tags or permission as a, a landholder but when we were young I did we didn't know this because there's no social media to inform you what you're doing is illegal but you can't just shoot a kangaroo it's some it's two and a half thousand dollars or five thousand dollar fine if you get caught with a kangaroo carcass or being proven to shoot one without your permit or tag or uh, proper reasoning so um, but they kangaroos in Australia weren't in the numbers they are now. So when Australia was arid, low amounts of water, large amounts of scrub, like the whole of the East coast was probably covered in scrub forest up the coast where you are all the way through. And there was no set pastures. There was plains where there was pastures, but there wasn't. So then the white fellas come in, we clear the land, we dam up the gullies, we improve the property for grass. So then doing that for our cattle also just provided the perfect environment for kangaroos. So you go from having 10 or 15 kangaroos in the bush. If you go into a native bushland, you don't see mobs of them. You'll see if you're in a native bush area, there's very few kangaroos, but you go into farmland, there's mobs of 150, like massive. So they're the biggest pest to a, to a cattle farmer except here where the deer are, <laughs> yeah. are just as bad. But that, they would be the biggest pest because they eat what the cattle and the sheep eat. And 
they don't they just they breed and breed and breed and multiply and multiply and it is special you have to be special to shoot them so you have to have licenses and they, they, they've re- lifted the restrictions now um, in certain places allowing farmers to do it especially in the drought to, to reduce numbers um, but that is the biggest thing against um, again what well, goes against it's animals that rob the food and water of cattle and sheep mm. Yeah, and if, if you're looking at looking at your stocking rate and you've got a factor in 100 uh, kangaroos, <laughs> that uh, yeah. nearly half what you can put on. I couldn't believe it when I first got here to see the stocking rate. Um, used, used to drive in through dairy country in New Zealand and, and see massive mobs of 200 cows and coming here and there's sort of 200 cows over uh, about 20 paddocks worth. <laughs> Yeah, that oh, I was shocked when I was over there. I was like, these are the fattest sheep like I've ever seen. If one of your sheep fell over, it would continue to roll to the bottom of the mountain. That's like in Australia, they're just cubes, long skinny cubes. I just fall over. But over there, yeah, they just keep going. I just I was tempted just to kick one down the hill to see what had happened. <laughs> but, yeah, it's 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 um we don't get the rainfall, but yeah, the the stocking rate it depends. Some places actually a cow per acre. Some on the coast, depending on the rainfall, are more. But they are always fighting, always fighting, especially um, out west. They're always fighting the the wildlife for the feed. And then um, you spoke about New Zealand how there's no predators, despite the fact that the deer still hold on to that those sort of instincts. But when it comes to farming, how much are the dogs are a risk for the for the cattle um one of, one of my favorite aussie instagram pages is josh rogers and he's always bringing up little game cameras and showing these wild dogs and and the guys out casino way are constantly saying oh there's bloody dogs on my on my property and i can't catch up with them um what do they what do they do to the cattle are they game enough or stick to the sheep no they're and they're getting worse too i i'm not a i don't know a lot i just hear what people say and, and read and talk to a few people but the if you go and hunt in Victoria, and this is another thing on the natives, I was surprised the first time I hunted in the Alpine area of Victoria that there, I didn't see any wildlife. The only wildlife I saw was deer. Mm-hmm. And the reason there was no wildlife is because the wild dill, the, dills, <laughs> the wild dogs had killed everything. Every wallaby was gone. They either moved out of the area or they killed it. And that's another thing that Josh says is when – you'll stop seeing wallabies when the dogs come in. So some will move and some will die, get eaten. And that's the, with farmers can lose a big sheep farm bordering on a huge chunk of national park, even not far from here can lose tens of thousands of dollars. They could lose, some people lose 50% or more of their lambs and calves to dog attacks, especially in Victoria bordering on big areas where the dog packs are getting up five or six or seven animals. So they're a huge, huge impact, massive impact, and they're extremely sly. So we've got a few guys. There's a guy who lives here locally. He's about my age, I think, maybe a bit younger. And he, that was his whole job. I'm not sure if he's doing it now because it's, it's, it's state-funded um, for that position. But that full-time job, trapping dogs for farmers, that's, mm. there's enough out there to supply people with a full-time job. And there's, they've got no predator and we give them a food source. So they, if they're bordering farming country, especially sheep, they're going to have a full litter of pups every time. Mm. There's nothing to stop them having a full litter of pups. And we, we're not shooting a full litter of pups out of that spot. So the numbers of dogs, we do do aerial baiting, which is um, pretty good. But as you guys from New Zealand know, aerial baiting is pretty shit too. Um, yeah. It doesn't. It's not effective, and there's a lot of uh, carnage on the side. So, but they they they're a massive impact. They'll they take down calves with, without hesitation, and uh, any livestock, anything they can, if they think they can have a crack, they will. So, yeah, that was what was yeah. pretty pretty amazing from Josh the other week when he hit the video of um, I think it was only three dogs taken down in the sand, but it was uh, that's unbelievable. <laughs> Yeah, and, and people will argue that people who know dogs, you hear them see them comment on social media posts, they're not pack hunters. They, won't, they don't pack hunt or dingoes don't pack hunt, but there's so many dogs, like regardless if they look like a dingo, there's still wild dogs and they'll still, there's still going to be traces, whether there's 2% domestic or whatever, you know what I mean, the, the crossbreeding, that's their DNA. Mm. The, that's the DNA is to hunt 
they're a pack animal. That's how they work. So eventually, in the same way that we have the desire to hunt, yet we haven't needed to hunt for a couple of hundred years or whatever, maybe maybe more, depending on your my descendants go way back into Ireland, Scotland, Wales, where they've had farming animals like but the same with the dogs it doesn't matter if that dog's been domesticated for 50 years or 100 years it's still in its dna to be a predator and be a pack animal and hunt and i think yeah that it surprises a few people that that's happening and um it's great josh is getting awesome photos (laughs) prove some other people wrong yeah they don't they don't hunt like that even though all the normal guys know that they do because they see it happening all the time yeah, and especially if you're on the farm. And um, that's what I've been sort of trying to highlight a, a few times on the podcast is how removed we are, not only from our food, but how removed we are from nature. And, you know, when you when you look at a, a chihuahua or, or a poodle in, in the street and then you look at what's what he's showing in, in the bush, they're, they're, they're the same thing, but two completely different things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wonder how they'd go. A pack of chihuahuas, I reckon they'd. They'd be pretty savage little buggers. All the ducklings in the area would have to watch out. No, absolutely. Um, one of the farmers in New Zealand had a, had a picture of his uh, foxy taking taking out a po- again a possum um, the other day. They they're not scared either. And, and there's a guy in Lake Hawea in the South Island as well. He's got a little foxy that just runs the hills ragged. To, <laughs> always picking up hares and, and, and rabbits. They they could wee things. Yeah, yeah, they use them here ferreting quite a bit. Yeah, the foxy will wait at the edge of the hole. They'll send the ferret down and if the rabbit comes out and no one gets it, the dog will get it. Or they send them down the holes and down the burrows, yeah. A little, and pig dog is out west. You see a few odd photos of a little foxy trying to have a go. This, this pig that's 10 times as big as it. Yeah, no, great great bailers. That's what they did the same in New Zealand. Um, the, one of the rugby players, Tim Berry, he, he often will have a little yappy with him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mate, what, what I wanted to get you on for it. And, and Adam Kavner rec- recommended you as well when we were having a chat. He said, oh, you, you've got to talk to Toby. I think that's how I started. I might have just started following you on Instagram or, or after that conversation. But um, in, in New Zealand, you know, last year we had that, the whole tar thing come on and all of a sudden hunters were under threat from from bureaucratic legislation and we're like, oh, shit, we've got to, we've got to look after this. But it's something in Australia you guys have sort of battled with for a long time and I guess it, it changes your, your perspective and hearing you speak on other podcasts, you've sort of got a quite an open mind and nuanced approach to to the fact that, you know, things need control and, and you know, hunters can wave their arms, but it, realistically you've got to do do your bit. How do you see the, the management of an introduced species in Australia? Um, sort of what, what's your take on it, how our role in, in managing them and then, who we should be doing the work for as well as, you know, filling our, our freezers and feeding our families and that sort of stuff. And, and if you get something good, putting a, a beautiful trophy on the wall to represent all the hard work that you've done. Yeah, we've got a problem with everything that we like to hunt in Australia is an introduced species that we can't, we can't hunt kangaroos. Or we, not that they have any trophy aspect, but everything we like to hunt is is introduced is a impact on the natural environment on farming on all that so before anything we have to think that which a lot of guys do think of that it's it's but there is a, a value to this the sport or the activity of hunting and we have such a divide between the two points of view that there's nothing can work together if you know what i mean there's we have a lot of deer here in, in the area I live in and property owners do make money off them shooting. But the problem is that there's a lot of trophy shooting as well. And there's no emphasis on herd management, but say 25 years ago, it wasn't huge here. And then the deer populations exploded and a few good seasons, they got bigger. And then the drought hit on the back of a really good season two years ago. And so their, their home range just blew out and they went everywhere. And suddenly they're a real problem to all the farmers. It was like a, a it was a, a mixture of the, the perfect storm for what followed with, with, and it's happening actually all the way down. They just hit a proportion of plague proportions everywhere. But 
and the same with every other government organization on something, they never get funding and there's no reaction until it's too late. There's no management until it's too late. I don't know when deer in New South Wales became a game animal. I don't know. I've been shooting them forever. I only got a, a, my father was, we were on a farm. So you're allowed to shoot them as a pest class. You're allowed to shoot them as a farm owner or a relative of the farm or a worker. You're allowed to shoot them without a license. But I didn't even know this. We used to shoot them um, because there was heaps of them there and get rid of them and, and eat them. And, um, but there's no, they the, the class them as a game species. So then they became protected and then the numbers got too big or you'd have to get a license. And then some farmers used to like them to start with. And then the populations got too big and it's like suddenly, oh crap, what are we going to do about them? But the hunters, as hunters, we weren't shooting enough. Yeah. That, that's a major, a major thing. Victoria, they're, they're getting the same way. They're protected. But you, you just need a game license, but they're getting the numbers of Samba are getting really high and um, expanding the home range into towns and stuff. And it's going to be a problem there. So as hunters in Victoria, those guys need to be just shooting the crap out of them. And, and a lot of far, deer farming guys are saying the same thing. We, we will get to a point where the government's going to act down there as well. And they're, they're talking about another chopper shoot, everything again, but the country's really hard to shoot samba really hard to shoot out of the chopper apparently I've, I, I haven't had a lot to do with it um because of the density and the terrain that they're in in some of those areas um but up here we we should have shot more deer and it's happening down in southern new south wales they're going to start chopper shooting they're trialing baiting programs like they have done over there although they didn't aim for the deer in new zealand they were just a byproduct and then i think they liked it and now they're just doing it to get massive amounts of deer out of the system but um it it's so they're hor horrible at hitting, hitting a middle ground and keeping everyone happy everything comes in a knee jerk so they've come in now here and they're going to shoot the deer again and i in my particular blocks i'm seeing 10 percent of the deer population that once was and they're going to shoot them again and again over winter and i think they just want them completely gone to be honest in some areas but they're not shooting others and they will expand Again, they'll grow. It, it, it takes time for them to grow. Um, and so that's how we, we got there. No, we didn't shoot enough. And then when it was too late, some other people started noticing who we didn't really want to notice. The farmers were struggling. You're talking about kangaroos. You try having a property I shot on, uh, shot, shot on a property I shot on was six, <laughs> 1,600 acres. And they had... 150 or in one year between myself the property owner and the other guys shooting the place shot 197 deer off 1600 acres Jesus. which isn't that big and they were eating acres and acres of his sorghum and acres and acres of his oats so a deer eats i think it's one and a half times the amount of a sheep mm. so if they they shot 197 deer they still had another 100 odd deer on the place that were really cagey so it's 300 deer, so that's 500 odd sheep or whatever it is, 450 sheep. They don't have 450 sheep on their property. Imagine if they did, they, they'd be quite comfortable without these deer. So that it, we've, we've come to a point now where there's still places that's got heaps of deer. It's just this particular area where they've shot out. But now they've shot it out, we've got the opportunity as hunters, even though there's no deer there, to stick with the properties the deer will slowly come back and then we can manage the populations from there. We can keep them at a healthy number. And it means, even as a bow hunter, it means I've just got to shoot deer with the gun. I do to eat them because it's just way easier than <laughs> traipsing around um, trying to find a, a deer to shoot with a bow and then to find it somewhere. Well, yesterday was just being a hero. So <laughs> I don't normally carry them from all the way from out there, but um, I had my brother with me as backup. But um, they, yeah, I go to my parents' place that I, they have here now. They moved off the farm and got 100 acres and I, I can literally walk out their back door in the morning and shoot a meat animal. So I just do that for meat. But they're about to do a council shoot. The council's about to come in and shoot in town on council land with a suppressor and a spotlight. And there's only, I think, three people in the state that are qualified to do that. But they're that bad now here. So really, if I didn't want that to happen, I should be 
every hunter in this area that hunts these properties around town should be up there making the deer disappear so they don't have to do that and they're not not to worry about and the same applies on the properties we don't want our farmers it's really nice to go up in the rut and have 30 or 40 bucks to choose from but look this is what's happened now we don't have 30 or 40 bucks to choose from i have about seven and then when i look into the next valley it used to have 200 odd deer in it it, it's got about 10 now so moving on we can manage it we can reduce those numbers we can stop the need for the the other like the primary industries departments coming in and wasting not wasting our money it was effective for the farmers it was really good for the farmers but if we we can stop them stepping in and doing any more of this if we keep the numbers at a number that don't impact the properties we're hunting on and the farmers and the, the number on the, of deer on the properties that we're hunting on, if you're paying to hunt on those properties, it's enough to offset the loss of income they're suffering from the deer eating their crop. You there, Toby? Shoot. You there? or their cattle feed. Yep, I'm here. Yeah, we're back on. Back on now. Hello. Yep. Have you got yep. me? Yeah, we're moving. Yeah, this is, this is bloody Australian yep. internet, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, we, oh, you, yeah, yeah, it's great. I, I wouldn't know anything about it. I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're fixing it though, aren't you? You're, you're getting better stuff. I do it for a job. Yeah. yeah. Getting getting the better, better, better cable in. Yeah, we're slowly, slowly getting to where to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, where we you cut out there, mate, was that um, getting to the level with that, that the farmers can offset the level of loss from, from um, grazing of, of deer on their crops and, and, and their grass. Yeah, yeah. So if a lot of guys here will pay to have a... So might pay up to a hundred dollars a day I've tried to I just can't get them because when you mentioned club that's a lot of people but the deal was going to be when we signed up is one buck when the numbers were high we had to shoot five does for every buck had to shoot five does not yeah I want you to had to shoot to maintain the numbers um, if we secured the right property so yeah now we've we've gone back to ground zero I'm not too worried it should reduce the number of um, Wanderers that wander onto other properties looking for deer. Yeah. Um, it'll reduce the pressure on the farmers who get door knocked every year continually. Like one property I had, it wasn't out of the ordinary for them to be door knocked four or five times during the rut, um, which can be annoying. They're nice people. They just say no, but it's just annoying. Um, so that'll back off. And the deer, we keep the numbers down. The farmers don't even notice an impact. They see a few deer. They really do. People like watching deer. I love it. I love watching deer. They're just, I don't know. It's way more interesting than watching a deer sitting and eating and walking through the paddock than a cow <laughs> or a horse. There's something about watching deer that, that is, it's nice. Um, so a lot of the farmers, when they first, the deer first arrived, they liked them. They didn't want them shot. They enjoyed seeing five or six deer on their place but when it turned into 50 or 60 then it becomes a problem so it, it it's we're back to square one there's nothing we can do about it the ball the, the dice have already been thrown and in places the ball's already rolling for other methods of um control like they're trolling the baiting stuff and the only way to stop it is to make the farmers see there's no need for it mm. and then and that, the only way to do that is to reduce the deer numbers. So aside of all the other, so they want to declassify them. So at the moment we pay a fee to the Department of Primary Industries to have a license to say we can shoot deer. And for them to go and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a chopper to shoot all the deer on the property I'm paying to go and shoot the deer on mm -hmm. is really annoying for everyone. So they should have declassified them then did the chopper shoot. So we didn't need licenses and they're fining people for not having a license and then shooting them on social media. Mm -hmm. And that really peed, peed a lot of people off. And yeah, that, that they need to sort all that 
crossover stuff out. And if they move on from here and declassify them and as a game animal and make them a pest, I personally don't think that'll affect them at all because everyone's shooting them anyway. Mm -hmm. Farmers are shooting them anyway. They, they removed the restrictions. See, when they were a game animal a couple of years ago, you couldn't spotlight them, you couldn't bait them, you couldn't shoot them outside of March to October. Mm -hmm. um, all those restrictions got removed. I can tell you right now, farmers have been spotlighting deer for the last 20 years. It, they're just doing it to get, that's how you get rid of them, mm -hmm. under the light. It's the most effective way as a farmer to shoot deer. So declassifying them won't change. It, you may get a few lazy trophy hunters <laughs> who will go and, 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 and shoot them under the light, which has happened anyway. Again, people are doing that. So if they, uh, my personal opinion, growing up here in an area that's high density, declassifying won't change anything. It'll just mean guys can shoot deer and get meat all year round. Yeah. And, and they're doing that now. And, uh, through the grapevine, this was supposed to be the year that they declassify them. I've heard from a few people in the departments that say it's happening, it's happening, but nothing um, solid yet. I don't know whether they're waiting for the reaction after the chopper shoot um, to see what had happened. But that, that's really area specific, um, that, that chopper cull. Yeah, you just got to look at uh, New Zealand and, and see that declassifying deer doesn't make them not a problem anymore. Um, you said about no, no. You said about shooting five does to to the stag, and I've um, recently, after reading Cam Speedy's articles for years and years at, in NZ Hunter, listened to him speak about um, sort of herd management in, in in the case of a of a pest where you need to keep the numbers down, but you still want the quality. And, and that's exactly the sort of thing that he, he pointed out was that you've got to keep the, the hinds down. Um, one, so there's enough food so that the hinds that are left can, can cycle and can, can reproduce. Um, and two, so that when you get, uh, come, comes on to the, the raw or, or um, whatever mating season it is, that uh, the folks express their best genes and, and have a scrap for it and, and and the best genetics get passed on. And you put up that photo of, of two blokes who are pretty average sitting around um, after all, all their ladies have been shot out. What, what do you think might, might happen over the next wee while? Are there still some good older heads there around? Or, and there'll still be some good genes? Yeah, right? yeah, I laid eyes on the, the guy who had the girls. And so that valley, um, all that area, one year had 50 hinds in the area and I border on it. So I sit on the top of the mountain. <laughs> I had a, I, last year I had a 500 mil zoom lens on my Canon 5D taking wow. photos. And this year those guys were sitting up high on a bench and I've got a, it's only a 400 mil, but um, yeah, I can get down and have a look, but the big guy was in the bottom of the valley. So he was still a good deer. We still got good genetics and, and the genetics can still be passed on. This is where people forget is it doesn't, it, your genetics don't get better as you get older. So a one-year-old buck, uh, so sexually mature, I think, is 14 months for a deer. Um, I'm not sure. Around that mark, 14, 18 months. So even a, a doe that it's her first year, if she was sired or her mother was sired or the mother's mother was sired by a good stag and then a buck that is fourth or fifth generation sired, he still carries those good genetic traits. You just don't see them. So even if he's a two-year-old and he's a stickhead, he still could be a 240-point buck. And people just overlook that. That that it's still it's the genetics will still carry through. Just because you're shooting the biggest animals get shot every year doesn't mean there's no good genetics. They're just not getting to the age to get seen the full potential. Mm. And and another thing, talking with that narrowing down the population, is um, bucks. I know for fallow, I'm not sure about red stags. It's probably similar. So they drop their antlers at their lowest testosterone level. Mm. So when they're, so it peaks in the rut and then it slowly peters out to the end of winter when they, they cut their antlers. Last year, because of the drought, and this year will be very similar, the underweight hinds and does weren't cycling because it's so dry, they were under body weight. And then we got a few showers and so... Does were cycling later, hinds were cycling later, so the stags were still peaking a month or two months later, they're still at their peak testosterone levels because the estrus in the, the hinds were bringing them up, keeping them up. And once one stag or buck 
has that high testosterone level, it sort of stays with the others as well. So they're all at that peak in that vicinity. And the less does you have, the, other than the, there's more bucks got to fight over them, so they're more vocal, so you can find them easier. It's a shorter rut, but they can find, you can find them in the thick scrub. They'll be croaking. If there's too many does, they don't need to croak as much. They don't need to draw as attention. They don't need to, to roar as well. They might roar for two days or, or, or a couple of days, but the big boys, like the big boy the other day and the year before that I've viewed, are sitting there not roaring. The next guys under are the ones without the girls are the ones roaring. The big boys are sitting down there quietly. Um, but the less, the less, the more they have to get in there and argue over the girls. And then what happens is once you've got a small number of does or hinds and they're all serviced, the last, the last one serviced, the testosterone levels start dropping and they'll cast their antlers a little bit earlier. And then they, so they get a little bit longer time to grow their antlers. So they'll be a little bit bigger. So that's another advantage if you're a trophy hunter of keeping the numbers low if you keep them down. Some people say uh, three does to one buck or a stag or you can do one to one or two to one. Um, but the lower the ratio, the, the shorter the testosterone level is maintained. It's only to a, to a point, if you know what I mean. It's just not prolonged. So it's beneficial for antler growth as well. It's one of the factors other than winter feed and genetics and things like that, that that's also another benefit of having um, a good tight ratio of, of male to females. Yeah, and you, you look at a deer farm and, and you can send one boy out there for anywhere from 30 to 70, so, time, so it's no problem for them. They'll, they'll keep going as long as they're fed. Um, and on, yeah, on, yep. on that feed, you talk about um, animals bordering on farmland and the fact that the stocking rate's down, so they're jumping the fence and getting in on, into the best, best feed. Um, versus in a drought, what do you, and you said you sort of see some under-conditioned hinds. Um, do you ever have a look at what's what's in the in their pouch and see what they've been chewing on, or, or don't 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 want to burst uh, the bag? <laughs> no, I, I can I can watch them. Generally, the scrub thins out, so they're taking the green pick off off everything they can um, that's edible, and because they can go anywhere they want, they'll follow the green pick. And get rid of it so if the farmers are resting paddocks they take that they'll get right up the mountains where cows won't go and eat the green pick out of the greenest gully mm -hmm. and so they will always find the best feed because they can they're not restricted by anything they've got a home range and the drought expands that home range because they become the, the need to move further to get food but they'll always get the best of what they can which is why the stags steam the bucks and stags seem to be still in okay condition um, at the start of the rut. Not the ones I shot with, some of them were so fat, but um, they've been in probably, they can travel kilometres. So they, some for some areas can be in National Park, which has got no stock, and others are in green gullies. Others are uh, walking down on irrigation crops. I've got a mate who, who watches mobs of deer, like 50 deer sitting in the middle of the centre pivot irrigators, Shit. just chewing up the crops. And they do it at night. He's a roo shooter. And so he'd see that happen at night and he can't shoot the deer because he's not allowed to shoot the deer on that property. And little does the farmer know that when he comes out, he's cro it's not growing, but he, he's, he doesn't see them there because they're in and out in no time. And they'll walk a few k's back up the ridge and camp up the mountain in the thick, thick stuff. So... Yeah, they they are opportunity. They'll they'll eat what they can in a good season. They'll eat the best grass in a bad season. They'll eat the Greek. The, they'll uh, well, the fallow are more graziers. The red deer are are more browsers, which why we see the fallow down lower in the and big patches of farming country, and they'll be sitting out in the open. Whereas the red deer like to be have a bit of cover, um, but they'll browse and pick off the, the the new growth on any plants or shrubs. And a fellow posted the other day of a a fellow eating gum leaves um i've never heard of that yeah that's just eating the green gum leaves because the trees in the drought are starting to shed the leaves massively like, made it so much harder this rut because they're to reduce their, their evaporation rates they're dropping all their leaves um and yeah the deer was hoovering up the leaves he like um was surprised the greenest ones they were picking up like it's getting desperate if they've got to do that yeah just so. Just trying to get as much quantity as they can to get any any type of energy into that gut. Um, you just speak about how the the home range seems to have expanded and and um, 
you know, you've got more numbers across a larger area because they've had a boom and then there's nothing, so they're going in search of it. Is anybody, yeah. is anybody actually scientifically monitoring this stuff? Like in New Zealand, the Wapiti are collared. There's a, there's a few seeker that are collared um, up in the North Island. Is anybody really looking into this or is it just uh, word of mouth and, and farmers' feedback? Oh, I'm not sure, but before the DPI, I think, is supposed to do a cull, they're supposed to have evidence of why, like reasoning and the backing, why they're doing it. And I think they got one of the universities come up and do a count. But the problem is these guys, some of them do do deer research, but not like they do in NZ and not like they do in, in, in Europe and, and America. America's massive for research on deer. So Australia would be way, way behind unless they brought someone over. And... Um, they, I don't think they've done that. They're just going to areas and do counts mm-hmm. and count the species. I've been on a count years ago. We, um, the national parks were looking at purchasing a block of land. So we went in with the light and counted everything we could. Uh, possums, wallabies, um, everything. And they had to assess the, like how viable buying that bit of country was to the, the species that were in that bit of country. So um, I think at this park now, actually, it was a long time ago, but I don't think anyone's done that, that research. No. And no one, we've got a lot of deer farms and people say that's the deer, everyone blames deer farms, which is, which is a good scapegoat. Um, a lot of them did release deer, but they generally stay pretty tight in the area. Mm. So yeah, they Howard Egan from the, over there in NZ. He's got a book there. I've read, um, New Zealand fellow or something. I can't remember the name, but he talks about one of the valleys there where they, they took them 40 years to move 10 kilometers because mm-hmm. the, the area they were in could sustain their population to a point. So that's what happened here. Good seasons. Really, we got a, it's volcanic soil in this particular area in the Liverpool ranges and it's great, hugely fertile. And we had really good few years and, before 20 years we had a few droughts in between but yeah sustained their population easily until the drought hit and then you find deer people seeing deer that they've never ever seen deer before Mm. so even in in town here i hit a deer in 2000 and oh 2004 in the main street of town 4 a.m in the morning we're in a hurry a full four-wheel drive load of us and it ran out of the front gate of the football oval straight under the car and we didn't have time to, we were fully loaded. Roof rack was loaded. Everything was loaded in the car. We're off to New Year's celebrations. Like, what do we do? I'm like, oh, the council will pick it up. So we just dragged it to the side of the road. People in town thought it was someone's pet oh, dear. because they didn't know, because they never go out after dark. They yeah. didn't realize that every night anyway, there's deer in the football oval chewing on the grass and has been for 20 years. So <laughs> like it's um, a lot of people who think they've just arrived. They haven't just arrived. They've been there. But now you're also seeing them out in the middle of the day still eating. So, yeah, it's not unusual. Well, I've had bucks fighting in my backyard behind out. Like, I've shot a deer out my bedroom window off my, off my back lawn this year because they were chewing my turf up. So, <laughs> yeah. I had to sort them out. So, yeah, they, yeah. Um, they get around. I know um, New Zealand and Wellington, um, one of the more affluent suburbs is, is Eastbourne, and that's sort of surrounded by native bush and stuff and i know there are a few people getting uh, a bit titchy that their roses were getting eaten all of a sudden you know it was a dry year two years ago and yep. um yeah they're, they're coming into they probably had, have always come into the neighborhood but <laughs> they were uh they, 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 they love roses they they're the first thing they hit they chew all the petals off the roses it's like because they're so sweet i suppose but yeah that's the first thing there was nothing left in town here six months ago Every even agapanthers are chewing them down to the roots, like all the way down. Anything that was green mm. was gone. So, and you can't put an electric fence up because the ground's so dry. There's no earth, yeah. so the deer would walk through electric fence as well. So, yeah. yeah. Now there, um, you, you don't you don't want to end up like like you're talking about the states. You don't want to end up like those towns that have you know mobs of elk walking through every every season. That, that'd be a bit a bit scary. Um, even mm. even if yeah. you're you're a big fan of the movie Bambi. You'll you'll soon get a fright if you. Was that was that Australia? Somebody got attacked by a by a stag. Uh, he yeah re- <laughs> he got killed actually recently. Oh, so shit. but it was it, it was by his own. It was a a, a wop so red deer cross in the middle of the rut. Um and he was in the pen. 
Oh, right. Okay. So is that a so, fun? Yeah. I think so. I don't know. There's not a lot of details on it. So that's what I've got. It was a farm deer. It wasn't a wild deer. Yeah. And um, you guys in New Zealand know full well you do not get in the, uh, the pen with the red deer. But um, yeah, that was unfortunate. So yeah, no, that's, that's yeah. no good. Um, I've been in the, in the crush with a few, few deer, you know, when they're in velvet. And I oh, actually, I gave, gave one of the main breeders in New Zealand a hand to cut, cut off and score. Um, they were only just hard, but even then, yeah, he, he was the only one that walked them through and, and the crush, the gee, they can move their powerful animals and, and he would have Yeah, and when, when they're in the rut, it's, you can't trust them once, no. they're, once they're in rut mode. So, yeah, that's a bit unfortunate. Um, but yeah. yeah. On, on a uh, lighter note, <laughs> after that, yeah. um, tell us about your New Zealand trip, mate. Um, going back to how you ended up going there and also then what you've got planned is it May that you're going back? Yeah, um, going back in, well, in a matter of days. So oh, nice. um, what I did is we've got um, Doug Stonofsky. He loves New Zealand. Him and Tony are just um, hard, hardcore, hardcore dudes. Um, anyway, Doug took over South Pacific Bowhunter magazine. It's now named Arrowhead magazine. And um, I put in a couple of articles for Arrowhead and, and won, a, won a prize that Tom Jones had donated a hunt. So I was lucky enough to win that. And the option was chamois, tar or red deer. And the, out of the three, free range, um, like unguided, self-guided public land chamois and tar are much easier to access than, say, some good deer, good red deer. So I... And I hadn't shot a red deer. I've chased them for four years, but I can never quite get them on my property. They're always over the valley. All I can do is take photos and watch them. <laughs> I've watched another guy actually. Uh, the the deer was there, and he was there, and then the next day there's tire tracks in a carcass. <laughs> I yeah, I just see them and can't touch them. They're out of range. Um, so I picked red deer, and yeah, and then went over this year and. I was the first, I think I'm the first guy they've ever guided with a recurve and it's more, I shoot the recurve because, because it's harder. I've got an ego for <laughs> one, um, but it doesn't need to be tended to regularly. <laughs> if, if, you, if you stroke it every now and then, it's okay. So the, the recurve, I'm like, if I can pull off the recurve, I'll be really stoked. Um, and I was quite confident going over. So it was coming down and looking at my flight details and I can see an eight and a 45. So I'm coming down, got stuck and delayed by half an hour going to Sydney to the airport. And then Telstra stuffed up my phone bill. They were supposed to credit me some stuffed up fund and they didn't. And they didn't credit it a second month in a row. So they cancelled my phone. That <laughs> cut me off that day oh, so shit. suddenly i've got no phone no internet access i had to stop at a friend's house ring the wife tell her to ring a taxi and meet me somewhere then i was half an hour late but luckily i got there as the taxi arrived then i got to the airport and i'm walking into the checkout casually and i've walked past the flight details and i'm like i'll just check what gate i'm going to be at before i check in and it says 6:45 on on the fly out. I'm like, no, it was 8:45. It was 18:45. Yeah, yeah. So, an international flight. You're supposed to be there two hours beforehand. So, like, oh crap. So I just run to the New Zealand service desk. There was an empty lady. I just went straight up to her. I'm like, am I too late? Am I too late? So the radios get going, and by that time, it's it's smack on six o'clock, and or 6.05 and the radio's going nuts. No, no, they haven't finished loading. So, yeah, escorted here. To, I had oversized, had something else, and then ran all the way to the boarding gate, and I was the last person there. I was like, Did they just take you on board? scraped in. No, no, they, were, they weren't. They were still, they weren't taking off. Everyone loaded in seven minutes. It was like the fastest anyone gets on in a plane. Like, normally there's a lineup for ages. But, oh, I was packing. I was sweating and I was freaking out because the next flight wasn't until the next night. And 
Mm. It's, it's kind of ruined me. <laughs> it was, um, but then, yeah, I got on the flight and I made it. So I was all good. But then I got to New Zealand and my bank card wouldn't work. <laughs> Oh, and I didn't have time to change any cash in Australia. <laughs> so I couldn't. And I'm like, I'm going to have to walk to my accommodation, which is 5Ks away in the rain. But one ATM at the bank, at the, at the airport, <laughs> I could get money out at one ATM. So I was, it, was, it was a wild start. Yeah. 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 And so did, did, did you fly into Christchurch, did you? Yeah, I flew into Christchurch. Yeah. And just We drove out of Christchurch. We were up near Hamner Springs, so it wasn't far. Yeah. Um, to head up so an hour and a bit up to the um the station we're hunting with it's up up near molesworth somewhere that's one of the neighboring properties mm -hmm. which is bloody big station apparently so um and there's dock land all around it as well so yeah we went up and i was shooting pretty good to be honest um to start with with the recurve but yeah we spent we knocked back a few stags early on and they were, they were really they were roaring the first couple of days, but then it rained for 24 hours straight, like solid, solid rain. It, it lifted the height of the river. And, and I didn't know that I've seen photos of people driving up the river. I didn't know that it was the norm to head into the back country for most of these properties is the only flat bit of ground is the riverbed. So you literally drive up the riverbed and cross it 15 times getting into the back country. And, um, yeah, it went from being like halfway up, uh, like on the rubber of the tires to halfway up the doors. Jeez. So we got a, a ton of rain and, and I am not one to sit in camp. So <laughs> I, I got Matt and I was just sort of giving him the hint, hint, hint. We need to go walking. I don't care if I'm going to get wet. So we went and walked for six, six hours or something in the rain and went up through the thick scrub and checked out a few spots and I still loved it. It was still great. Um, the advantage, the advantage really enjoyed of, that country. Yeah, the advantage of your camp is that you had uh, you're obviously in a house and you had an open fire, so you could always um, dry, yeah. off, dry off your gear at least. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a the um, the incentive. Yeah, I wouldn't do it so much um, where I'm going to, or I wouldn't do it in Fjordland to go and get all your stuff wet and then have no hope of drying it. So yeah, we had a little gas burner in my room and. I just turned all the chairs upside down and put all the clothes out and dried everything. And um, I still had wet boots for the next few days, but I've just, just gone on the internet actually, because it was a good test. I've never done anything like that. Um, it's always been on the cards. I sort of needed motivation to make it happen. And, and um, so now I've just bought some Stony Creek um, wet weather gear um, from over there because I need better wet weather gear. So, um, yeah, anyway, we went through and and back and forth a few days, found a few good ones. Um, one cracker we, we stalked, we saw him from a few k's away in the video where he's up on dusk. You can see him on the top of the mountain there, like the king of the mountain. We're not. A, I don't know if you Kiwis call them mountains because they're only halfway up your actual mountains, but if they're in Australia, they'd be mountains. And, the, and we stalked all the way up to where he was, had everything perfect and crested the hill and he was gone. So, and then we looked at him for him for a, another day or two actually and he disappeared completely um so we went to another spot and and put in some good stalks we didn't get on the video but um we had the first morning of in one spot we had a stag a 13 or a 14 point stag come into four yards four meters whatever I, I didn't measure it out perfectly but yeah with the we were in the spikes again, surrounded by him so we sort of had I had no shot opportunity and it's just his head and he roars at us standing right there and camo just roars straight at us at four yards and i'm like i didn't get a shot but that's just cool anyway like that's a really cool experience and he couldn't tell what we were because i had face fails and gloves and all the stuff on which was a bit of i think for the guide he was he hadn't had to go to that level before he's normally had rifle hunters and hadn't had a lot of bow hunters in general so a rifle hunter you see it it's dead generally um anything 600 yards and under if the guys want it these these fellas carry seven mils which are like good for a kilometer so they're they're or they're 338 or whatever the rifles and great scopes so it's just there's no need to push yet here he's suddenly with me so um yeah he was pretty stoked too because he's never had to do that never had to get that close before 
um, and he really enjoyed it. Um, and then we went on to another spot and there was a, a bench full of wallows and you, the wind was being a pain in the butt as well. And the hinds were so alert um, because the property's been hunted since March. Mm-hmm. So all the deer, they know what people look like. And, um, and, and, and we'd park at the bottom of like on the creek level and walk up each time um, while well, the ridges and up into the valleys to, to try and prevent that. But yeah, the point that I, that busted me, it didn't break me. Nothing could break me. That's all I like to say. Anyway, um, the point that really, that, that almost beat me was we had a, uh, a nice 12 pointer. Well, it was, it was a bigger guy. It was probably 14 pointer at a wallow and he was roaring at this wallow um, surrounded by the, the, the Abigari or what would we call it? The spiky bushes. So, I got a photo of him. I didn't realize I had a photo of him. And I went down there when he disappeared out of sight. And the guide said up the hill. So it's about two or 300 meters down to where this spot was. So slid down on my butt, got the wind right. I'm just through the scrub. And, and in those benches, some of them just become muddy swamps. So it's just mm-hmm. mud. And this other 12 point has come up to the, the end of the bench like so that people don't know a bench it's sort of where the land slipped a little bit and flattens out and then it drops off into a steep gully and above the bench is also steep so it's a little flat spot and the water sits in those flat spots and and or a spring will expose at the flat spot and the, the reds get in there and they turn into a muddy messy hole and so i stalked all the way and I got to sort of 20 meters or 10 meters off this guy roaring and I had one little bit of scrub and I'm kneeling in the mud and I've got a little bit of scrub in front of me and this guy and you can see on that video the steam coming out his mouth as he's roaring he's going non-stop but he's facing quartering on so for like 10 minutes or 15 minutes he didn't move. He just stood there roaring at the thick scrub at the other side where I think this bigger 14 pointer had the hinds and this 12 pointer didn't have them, yeah. which is why when the big guy went into the scrub, he came out of the scrub because he's not going in there to, to, for the bigger deer. He's got the girls. So he just kept roaring and roaring and roaring. And, and eventually I'm videoing with my phone and he saw the flicker of the screen and it got inquisitive. So he just walked straight over to me at five yards. I can't stand up to shoot, which is where I'd practice. So I had to hold the bow sideways. And um, (laughs) the wife said to me when I get home, but that's the kill shot. You see in the movies where (laughs) where they hold their gun sideways. Kill shot, kill shot. (laughs) It's really hard to judge your height when you're holding the bow fully flat. And I hadn't practiced that in a long time. I practiced when I first got the bow seated, shooting flat. But holding it flat, you can't get your height. Anyway, I shot straight between his legs, straight under him yeah. at five yards or five meters. And he still didn't see me. So he's still inquisitive. So he's walked. They, what they'll do is if the deer are unsure of you, they'll circle you to try and pick up your scent. Yeah. They'll try and wind you. So he's tried to circle. And so I've hind called and stopped him at 10, still sideways. All I can do is pivot on my hips. I can't move my knees or anything. So I've pivoted on my hips, can't move the bow to give me away drawn back, shot again, just straight under his chest. Like, ah, so then he's moved behind another tree, circling a bit more. I picked the spot. I shifted positions. I had the bow at about 45 degrees this time, but I was shooting through long grass and reeds. Mm -hmm. And I sort of had a half view and I was thinking the arrow will arc over and then under his body, uh, under, over the reeds and then under and straight into his armpit and lined it up and fired and the arrow disappeared into the grass and the deer didn't get shot. So that one I was suspect on. I'm like, I was pretty right on that. So I think there may have been grass combined with me not giving it the right elevation. And then he jumped back to where he was roaring. So 20 or 30 meters a bit further and he's looking. So I started hind calling and this is when it got really cool because he's just getting turned on. So he's peeing everywhere nonstop like a fire hose. And he's trotting around. He's trying to look for me and just roaring. Every breath, he was roaring at me continually. And it was so cool. He's just at me, at me, at me. And he's trying to see, he's trying to get me to move out from behind this bush, but he's second guessing. And at that point, I hear another roar behind me. And it just lifts the hairs on my back of my neck. 
because I know what deer was down behind me. Mm -hmm. The wind's coming down the hill, across the bench, and down to where this bigger deer was. So I've had to do the army roll. So I dropped behind the bush even more, rolled in the mud and grass, over the lip of the bench, crawled through the grass, and then got to a point where I could sit up so that one deer was behind that tree and one deer was behind that tree. And I, I stood up. And as he came up and he, he's behind that tree, I drew back, but he caught my movement behind the tree and he turned and walked out full broadside next to me. And I don't think this is where I think I didn't get to full draw because I balked when he saw my movement. And this guy was a, he was a 40 plus inch, 14 point stag. He's a great stag, great mature animal, like six plus years old. And yeah, I bought and and I think not getting the full draw. So when I released, I pushed my bow away from me at the same time, and it's just sipped straight across the front of his chest. And the oh. guide's looking around, going, "The arrow's going through him, but I can't see any blood, and he's, there's nothing happening." But he just seen the arrow go through the front. And uh, once I fired that shot, I only took four arrows with me because I don't like to empty a full quiver because you'll lose them. And we lost one in that situation. It went in the grass is knee high and thigh high in those those swampy areas. You just can't find it. So it yeah, it busted me big time. I was like, Devo. So I went back, got out of the car and shot the cube and hit the bullseye at thirty five meters. <laughs> as soon as I got home and I'm like, Oh wow, what what did I do? And I just choked. As I said in the video, I just choked. I just didn't I didn't I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I'm always proud to admit it's never my gear. It's, it's the animal didn't jump the string. It wasn't that I wasn't standing right. I just didn't do it right. And um, that's the way it goes a lot with a, with a recurve because you haven't got your fixed pins or your fixed yeah. peep to look down. You haven't got those gauges. Everything's in a moment of pressure. Everything's got to run on instinct. And I've only been using the recurve since March last year and I only really started hunting deer with it in April last year and I'm I was picky and I'm picky with what I shoot I I don't just shoot everything um I still like to pick a harder target a bigger animal for the trophy generally the guys that are trophy animals are the harder animal that's why they're bigger and older so I always try and pick the harder animal and um I haven't shot enough so I've come home and um decided to do a bit of whack and stack um, and I'm just going to have to shoot a lot of stuff, which won't include deer because there's not enough of them on my <laughs> on my block anymore. They really did a good job. But yeah, then after that, I I still carried the recurve. I was still stubborn enough that I was going to get it done, but I needed a shot at 10 meters where I was really comfortable. And in my head, I was going to do it. But then the, the opportunity presented for a good stag and I was stalking in with the recurve. So we're, we're down the bottom of a mountain and... Oh, I keep saying mountain it's over it'd be over a thousand feet which is your, that's what a mountain is anything over a thousand feet so at the bottom of the the new zealand hill and there's a stag's roaring on the top ridge just where it crests um before it goes out of sight so it's just straight up um so i go straight up and the, the hinds balk him because you still can't tell they, the stags are a bit dumb and they can't tell what's what but the hinds know so they're moving off and i'm in full open flat Tussock, and he's looking at me and I'm like oh let's just try something so I put the bow on my head like uh, like you do with hunting moose and you put the fake ears up so I put the bow on my head and just started moaning and walking towards him and I made it to 80 meters from him like from about 150 I reckon from when he first saw me just walking at him with the bow on my head swaying like a stag strutting and eventually um he realized the girls were all gone so he went but then they all went into a bit of a real thick basin of scrub and there was another stag in there and some roaring going on. So we moved into when the wind was right and the scrub was thick and I could see them thrashing the trees moving and I was going to get right into there with the recurve in a good spot. But the stag came out at 50. What I, I, I saw him coming and I saw some girls walking and one of them was hot. She was, she was cycling. So she was the one creating all the commotion. Um, I knew that was going to happen. And in this situation, the, the guide was right there with me, which is great because he's so eager. And it's the last morning and we decided to stop hunting at 12 because the next group of hunters were coming in that night and it was with the property owner. So 
we had to clean up the cabin and the rooms and, and make it all nice. And I had the time of my life and I was going over there with no expectations. Um, I wanted to get a stag, but I didn't have to. I would never have picked up the rifle in any situation to shoot a trophy. I just, the trophy is the act of getting the trophy for me. It's not the actual trophy. So um, anyway, yeah, this, we'd agreed to do that. I said, righto, we've got to be, let's turn around and walk back to the car at 10 o'clock. And I shot the stag at 8.30, I think. And by the time we cleaned it up, it was 10.15. when we turned around and walked back. But yeah, I composed myself fully. And he said to me, geez, you were shaking. It took forever to take the shot. And yeah, I was shaking like a leaf. And, but I had to get the shot perfect. And, and when I fired, yeah, perfect heart shot. And he just went two body lengths and just stood there and swayed and then fell over on the spot. So hmm. that was a bit of a... A bit of a bittersweet. I would have liked to do with the recurve, but um, I still did a really good shot on the last day on a, a pretty nice stag. So I was pretty happy. And the guide was there. Matt was there with me. So he'd, he'd been on the journey. <laughs> he said he'd never going to take another recurve hunter out. It's too painful to watch all the shot opportunities and nothing come of it. <laughs> so, um, it, it, yeah, it was, it was great. It, it's probably what... Um makes it so enjoy enjoyable is just sheer amount of challenge and, and getting in close. Um, you said about how it's a, you don't have the pins there with, with the recurve. How are you um, how are you picking your distances and picking your heights um, with the recurve? Well to start with I was I, I got pretty good to start with with running the curve of the flight of the arrow. Mm -hmm. But then I got told a lot of guys we use point on. So when they draw back and you get your form and your anchor correct, you put the point at a certain distance below, above, or on your target. Mm -hmm. So now I've gone to that and I'm after getting the other stuff right, I'm I'm pretty really I'm really confident with it. And so I'll put the point on the target at, at forty yards or forty meters. My range finder used to go to yards, now it only does meters because for some reason. So oh 40 God, meters. <laughs> yeah, oh, I was before that, it was just temperamental. I stopped yeah. using it. I just ran without it for ages. But then when I started this point on method, I started using it again because I loved the fact that I was just guessing, but also missing a lot. So now, yeah, I run point on it at about 40 and then uh, 20 yards, I'm two inches, the point's two inches below the point I want to hit. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing with the recurve. If you don't look... At the point you want to hit, you'll shoot over every single time. You shoot over the target. I did it on a red deer here at home. I've done it on pigs and I still do it and I know it. But yeah, you've got to look right at the spot on that animal you want to hit because subconsciously, for some reason, you it's like throwing a rock. You look at where you want to throw it. You don't look at if you you don't look at a, a ra the rock next to the rabbit and throw it, or if you're riding a motorbike, you're an experienced bike riders or push bike or push bike downhill anything. If you look at a rock or a tree stump, you hit the bloody thing on a push bike. So if you look next to it, subconsciously you don't have to avoid it. it like consciously you don't have to avoid it because you'll you'll go past it if you're not looking at it. But if you look at a rock, you always hit the bloody thing. So it it, it sort of applies with that that get your point on eye level, uh, look at where you're going to hit. And in the, in your peripherals, you have your point on at a certain point with your, your broadhead or your field point. You have that at a certain guesstimated gap below, above or on, depending on your distance. Mm. And, and then that's how you shoot. But if you're kneeling and you're shooting up at an animal, it's different. Or if you're kneeling and sh if you're shooting down at a steep angle, it's different. So that's where practicing in the field, and shooting more wild pigs and goats is going to benefit me because I'll be shooting in a non-flat environment with different variations in geography. So, yeah. And, uh, your, your, your placement's still just as important with those animals though, right? Just maybe less pressure. Is that, is that the case? Uh, the, uh, the arrow placement, shot placement. Yeah. Or, yeah. You say, oh, it's critical that... Oh, go on. I was just going to say, so you're saying that you need to do it more and in order to do that, because the deer numbers are down, you've got to go after these other species. That You're still under the same pressures, though, when it comes to those other species, though, right? Yeah, I, I, the pig, they chop a shot the pigs as well as the deer. 
there's no one says anything about that. They've chopped shot the deer, for, the pigs for years. This is where the reality of it is: is more people eat. Um, I reckon more people eat pork and goat in the world than eat venison. Yeah, I'd say. Pretty honest, the goat's probably one of the most eaten animals in the world because of third world countries all eat goat. Um, and the Middle East and all, they all eat goat. They chop shoot the goats. They bait the pigs. They chop shoot the pigs. No one says anything. They do it to the deer because of the, the trophy hunter aspect or the value of the meat. Come on, guys. Goat, shooting a goat is way more value to the people of different ethnic background than it is to us. We don't care because we call it a second grade meat, but they love it. Mm. Like so, I'll shoot pigs, but they shot all the pigs, the pigs as well. So I've got no pigs left on some of my blocks. So I've only got big boars, and they're just as much pressure. So a big thirty-point boar is the equivalent of a um, a two hundred and forty-point fallow or or a three hundred-point stag. Mm. You don't come onto them every day, and you don't know that every boar is not going to be that because the tusks may grow into their jaw a lot further. And yeah, I missed a perfectly good old boy. He didn't poke out a lot out of the tusk, but he had a massive head and I missed him at like 10 metres um, the other week. But the goats, yeah, I got some access to some, they like the goats because they chew the things up, but they, they let me shoot one or two. So I'll just chase the biggest billies and try and shoot them. But pigs, um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be on for the pigs. But um, my, one of my blocks, my fellow blocks is owned by hunters three blocks around it owned by hunters. So we literally don't shoot a single female deer out of that place. And it doesn't sustain a lot as well. So we only shoot the bucks um, out of that joint, which is where I took that buck yesterday, um, yeah. was out of there. Yeah. Can you eat the pigs in your area? There was something that Morton was saying that he got sick himself and there's a bit of a question mark around the pigs that he's um, going after. There's nothing wrong with the meat. They got brucellosis and... Yeah which makes you crook and another illness from their sweat and their skin. Mm -hmm. But if you, it's the same with um, trichinosis that you get in the bears in the Northern, if you cook the meat above a certain temperature, it kills anything anyway. Yeah. So you just skin the animals, keep them clean and cook it. I don't eat the pork cause I'd rather have deer in the fridge. Yeah. And it's tough when you eat it fresh, you got to slow cook it. And I, I'm not a good cook. So I don't bother. It was too hard to cook. I don't do it. The fellow cut it up thin. Like we cut some, we ate some of that fellow yesterday raw. We cut it into sashimi and we're dipping in soy sauce. It was good. So it was only aged. It was a rutting buck and I'd only aged him for about four or five days. Um, but we needed the room in the fridge and he was great. He was absolutely yeah. brilliant. Um, but yeah, I just, the deer, I just salt and pepper or a crumb. Um, or we roast it. Like we just treat it like lamb. Um, yeah except it's got a lot less fat on it yeah, but, yeah i don't i don't do the pigs i have eaten a few and i've given some to the guys i got friends in the sydney and they said it was the best pork they've ever eaten some wild pig so yeah, yeah. you guys yeah. love it the, the kiwis love it i know that they yeah, it's well, like gold well when nick said he didn't really eat them after he got crook i was just like oh man <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> that, that, you know you, you look at it bristling in the in the pan it's got this black skin on it and you and you cook it up and then you chew into it and the fats are outrageous um you you, you sort of process it yourself but um what what, what happens with the gap of, of culling it uh looking after it and then not being able to cook it what's the story there? you need to get a bit of uh, Stephen Ronella in you a bit, bit of his cookbook maybe not oh, for the pig yeah yeah I, also where I hunt is I'm I love walking and climbing mountains. That's what hunt that that goes hand in hand. I don't want to go out and walk for an hour. If I want meat, I take the rifle and I shoot it within a few hundred meters of when I start hunting. Like within so one day I drove up and my parents were getting some wood and the, the house is like I'm just like driving up. I'm like, oh I'm just gonna shoot wait a minute. Look up on the hill, there's a deer, just lean out the window, shoot in the head. <laughs> and walk and drag it back down to the parents. Don't worry, it's done. So then get back in the car and drive home. Um, I like the walk. Mm -hmm. I want to, so when I shoot a big mountain boar, which I only do one or two a year, if that, or even a really nice uh, young one, a young pig to eat, I shoot them 5Ks from the car. Mm -hmm. And I've normally got a full backpack, a bow, cameras, all that gear. And lots of the guys that carry out, 
animals, you see them carrying the pig out. They didn't see them carrying. So yesterday, carrying that deer out, I had my camera, my tripod, my rattlers, everything on that pack. Um, and my brother carried the gun. <laughs> That's what. So he carried the deer for a little while to um, give us a break and because he wanted to know if he could do it as well so but that's another thing it's it's a long way and i love the mountains and hiking and walking so unless i shoot it close to the car and i've done that with a little pig and then i i scalded it so it was pink even though it was black the black yeah. rubs off them yeah. and um we cooked it up and it wasn't too bad um but it's most of the time i shoot them they're way up on the top of the mountain and and there's one track up either property I hunt on, just one steep track. And one of them's no one's driven on because the, the dozer driver was like, don't, don't take a car up that track. <laughs> so yeah. it's, um, it's just, yeah, long up and down too. Like I'll park at the top of the, it's a, a thousand meters, the top of my property that I hunt on the two blocks and I'll park at seven or 800 meters up and walk to the bottom and then walk back up to the car. Or I'll park at the very bottom, walk up, and then walk back down to the car. So um, sometimes it's not real conducive to taking out what I do it, and I'm just there to to walk through the bush. Mm. I'm probably my my kill ratio, especially now in the drought, is for that particular block. Might have, not even four to one. I've killed something the last three times. I've been out there because it's the rut and the, the 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 bucks have moved in. But the three or four months prior to that, um, not much at all. And I still go out there for the walk. What was that pack? It was pretty awesome. How you just, you know, took the, uh, the, the that, bag off it and then carried carried it on on the back. What was? Yeah, it? that that's the um uh, the XO Mountain Gear from um he's uh XO E X O on um Instagram and and Pat at Boulder Creek Archery Pat Tidings is the only external outlet for them in I think in the world actually, um and he's a mate from fifteen minutes up the road, and so he introduced me to those packs and they are sensational. Mm. I've got no neck or shoulder pain from that. And that my little, I got like little fish scales and they only go to 60 kilos and it put the pack on it just went OL. So it was overload. Mm. So then we got the house scales out, but it's too big to sit on the house scales and it went over 60. So that pack was somewhere between 60 and 70 kilos and we carried it two plus kilometers. Shit. um through the mountains but that bag allowed that it it the weight all sat on our hips and the small of our back on the top of the hips pelvis loading only loading the legs had to lean forward because you had your body weight leaning out the back so you need to center the center of gravity which means you still have to lean forwards but um didn't have any extra straps or anything that it's got a titanium frame um, so the frame doesn't compress and shoulder load like that. The I wanted to do that because lots of people carry deer out. You see it all the time, mm. but they're carrying them downhill 20, 30 meters to a side by side buggy or a car. Mm. But we literally had to carry that entire thing out um, all the way back to like the main track where the car was parked. Um, so yeah, was, then I wouldn't have been able to do it with too many other packs. There might be two other packs in the in the in the world that would be designed to do that with ease yeah that so, e um, e e stock one looks like it would be something that would sort of take it on as well uh, e Eberly stock yeah. yeah they they do i think they're a little bit behind kafaru uh, are releasing yeah. some pretty handy packs with that um that frame aaron's really really emphasis on on helping that like there's a real advancements in pack frames Mm. lately um a few others are still running fiberglass which allows for flex yeah. um compression and bending and anything with that even aluminium still flexes but titanium i can stand on the top of that frame and like bounce yeah. and it won't move it vertically the vertical strength in that frame is, is stupid so and it's designed to pull the pack off and put meat on it so yeah. that's yeah, that's cool. what they built it for packing out elk that's that pack's made for packing it and it didn't even didn't even falter yeah there's, there's a lot of weight yeah so yeah that's i was it. pretty stoked <laughs> that's the ultimate field test right there mate um so what did you think the main um challenge was of new zealand compared to what you used to uh honestly i didn't really think there was to be honest i loved it 
I, I was frothing. I was enjoying every minute of that. The prickles, I just pushed through the prickles. The wet, I, I didn't have to stay in a tent, so it didn't bother me. So my next challenge, which has always daunted me, it was always been daunting, um, and I'll add in why things are less daunting now, which is due to your podcast previously, but I'm going in May. We're going in to fly in. Um, I'm not sure which valley we're going into in the West Coast, but it's behind friends Joseph and Glacier. We're flying out of there. Um, we're going in for two weeks. And I have a lower back injury that gets niggly if I'm flying on a plane, sitting on a plane's horrible. Mm -hmm. And getting stuck somewhere is horrible in the one spot. So I can't get tent bound. So that will be the biggest challenge, being tent bound. So I'm, we're in there for 10 or 12 days um, hunting tar. And um, it, that will be a challenge. I'm not too worried about climbing the thousand, uh, literally a thousand vertical meters from camp to where we hunt them in the tops if we don't hunt the fringe of the monkey scrub and we may do that two three times in the in the stay um but the biggest challenge is same as if i was to go to fjordland is being tent bound that'll it, it once my back plays up i'm it i can still carry weight and and lift it's the bending and then it just goes into spasm and pain and there's nothing wrong with it as such but that will be the biggest challenge. Yeah. As far as New Zealand being over there, I, uh, there was no, I, I was like, feed me more. I was, the last day I was just motoring up the mountains, just soaking it. I just loved it. Absolutely loved it. Like I could live here easily. Yeah. So, yeah. But I, I, I'll get onto the point of why I, I, things aren't worrying as much as I don't know. Adam speaking to Adam Kavanagh is I, at Christmas time, I get on the, get on the sauce and the party and have a lot of, carbs and sugars and everything and I started feeling like crap and over the last 12 months total different aspect will go this is why the hills were daunting and are daunting for a lot of people the fitness aspect mm -hmm. but at Christmas I became a carnivore after yeah. Christmas period and no nothing physical daunts me anymore this this stupid improvement in my strength and endurance is unbelievable like I Grub smacked, speechless by the improvements because of a diet change. Yeah, due to listening to you guys on this and um, Sean Baker, which he's a minimal thing, but now I communicate with Dom um, over in the UK on Origins Nutrition. We talk often um, about things and, and I follow him and stuff like that has put any daunting of mountains and endurance and long out of my mind. Like I, I physically don't, worry about stuff like that as much anymore at all and so it's only been four months but it's a stupid improvement absolutely stupid improvement mentally physically all aspects of life from that change of diet so yeah, you know that's what i'm yeah. most looking forward to about new zealand it's, it's um getting back there and, and my mate's farms uh, i think 40 46 61 minutes down the road and um yeah we can go out on the back paddock and and do a little bit of um, wild deer management out the back there, and you know we, we've got a bit of duck shooting planned as well. So I plan to um, finally fill the eating well. Yeah, finally fill the freezer that I got before before we left, and have never used it. So it's going to be quite exciting, and, and yeah, I think um, my diet will, will start to be heavily meat meat orientated again, which is it's going to be bloody exciting, mate. I've just heard my um, daughter chirp up, so. Um, I'll be sure to share your YouTube and Instagram and is there anywhere else where people can track you down? Yep, that, um, no, just those two. I, I did double in photography at the moment and I'm sort of hoping to build a bit more in the video, but um, I'll push that when it comes time, but um, the Facebook side of things. But yeah, Matt, I'm big on Instagram is my hunting and, yeah. and outdoor lifestyle place to hit me up at, 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 at Hunt Mountains at Instagram. So. Yeah, and then YouTube, hopefully you see a massive improvement um, and some more content coming. Working, man. That, that, yeah. last, that video from New Zealand was sensational and I'm excited to see another one when you get to the wild west coast. Um, Thanks, what's, yeah. What's some ideas that you'd like to leave us with, brother? Because there's been an awesome chat and, and it's good to, good to connect. Um, regardless of what... I, I, had a, I had this, I listened to this and I'm thinking how to word it. 
and it's, it revolves around how you portray yourself nowadays. And I think I'm trying to be as honest as possible because people appreciate the honesty of me missing, of me getting angry, uh, of me. People don't enjoy seeing everyone that's 100% successful. So show everyone your weaknesses and failures at the same time you show them your successes and they'll appreciate and respect you more for it. Yeah, mate. Okay. But of, um, yeah, so, making sure we're honest with who we are, right? And, you know, that comes both internally yep. and externally. It's awesome. Thanks, thanks yep. so much, Toby, for, for making the time for us. This has been awesome. Um, and uh, all the best in New Zealand and, and hopefully we cross paths soon. Um, I'm still yet to cross paths with Adam as well. So, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll need, <laughs> need, need to do that. Sounds good. Sounds good. Look forward to it. Cheers, brother. Have a good one. Okay, life. mate. Thanks for having me on.